When you look at the economic pushback that Putin is seeing right now from pretty much every major nation out there here, do you think that those tactics are effective in and of themselves? With Putin himself, I doubt it. He's happy with autarky, I think. Uh, he very much, I think, wants to close the close the doors uh, of the outside world to Russia. He's certainly behaving that way. And he's never been uh, you know, great in the field of economics. So <laughs> I think he would be just as happy uh, if Russia were totally cut off from the outside world and forced to be self-sufficient. That's certainly how he reacted after 2014 and uh, the Russian invasion of Crimea. So I can see him not personally being very concerned about this, but the pressure on him is growing from his business community. And I also think from the public seeing their access to the internet, for example, shut off now, uh, that has really become something the Russians depend on for communications, not only among themselves, but also with family abroad. So this is a tough moment. There's a lot of talk about whether the economic sanctions will be enough to, I guess, reverse some of what uh, Putin is doing here. But there have been a lot of calls now for some degree of a military response, particularly from NATO. We've heard from NATO officials today on this Friday basically saying that they have no intention, at least right now, to enter into Ukrainian airspace or to put boots on the ground here. Do you think that that is a position that NATO can stand by? I think the Secretary General, Secretary General Stoltenberg, was right when he spoke after the foreign minister's meeting today. Uh, NATO's biggest responsibility right now is to stop this invasion uh, in Ukraine from becoming a general war in Europe, from becoming World War III. Nobody wants to see that. It's in nobody's interest to do so. And so I think it is extraordinarily important for NATO to help the Ukrainians in every way it can, both on the military front and also on the humanitarian front, but not to put boots on the ground and not to not to uh, implement a no-fly zone. So I do think that is the has to be the top strategic objective for NATO right now to avoid World War III. There's also, of course, concerns about the nuclear issue here. We saw, of course, footage of what appeared to be an attack by Russian forces on a nuclear facility in Ukraine. That, of course, alarmed a lot of folks about the security of some of those facilities. What can be done, if anything, to ensure the security of those facilities? Well, the Russians certainly know nuclear power plants. Uh, they, they built those VVRs along with the Ukrainians during the Soviet era, so they know them well, they understand them well. What worries me is that they're not taking a very responsible stance now toward attacking civilian targets of all kinds, especially, you know, a nuclear power plant. So we really did dodge a nuclear bullet last night, I think. But it is, I think, uh, nevertheless important to not only uh, pay attention at, a, at an international level, Rafael Grossi, the Secretary General of the IAEA, excuse me, Director General, speaking to the UN Security Council this morning, keeping those, uh, those controls in place at, at an international level to the degree possible, and certainly the attention of the world at an international level. But then second, I think to remind the Russians that in fact, you know, if there were a nuclear accident at that plant, it could impact Russian territory. It could re result in radiation uh, contamination of Russian territory. Do they really wanna see that in their, their most fertile farmland down there in the south of Russia? I don't think so. So it's in their interest to ensure also that this plant remains safe and secure and does not get attacked. Barring, I guess, whatever um, initiatives that European countries and the U.S. can take to maybe uh, fend off Putin here, is there any sense here that we could start to see maybe a little bit of a pushback from Russia's other neighbor, China? Interesting, this week, the foreign minister of Ukraine called the, his foreign ministerial counterpart, the foreign minister of, of China, and they seemed to come to some meeting of minds that China would start to facilitate diplomacy in this regard. I think, frankly, that uh, could be a very interesting development. Uh, certainly, there are ways in which China's economy will be affected by a continuing crisis in Ukraine. So I think there's an interest there for China to lend a helping hand. We'll see. Obviously, Beijing's walking a fine line. They don't want to completely, uh, they don't want to completely, uh, you know, turn their back on Vladimir Putin. He's uh, their main partner in many ways, mm -hmm. but they also need to show that they're responsible players on the world stage, I think. So could be an interesting development for China to get involved. Draw on your experience here. When people start talking about a new Cold War, is that overstated? Well, there's a big difference from the Cold War. We were really cut off from each other during the Cold War in so many ways. The communications that led to the 
the lack of communications that led to the Cuban Missile Crisis 60 years ago this year, ironically, uh, actually, you know, it's much different now. We have many, many lines of communication open with Russia. You've seen Chancellor Schultz and President Macron calling Putin in the last couple of days. We will stay in touch. We will continue. I think that gives us an opportunity for some intensified diplomacy and efforts to stop this uh, terrible invasion. So uh, if, if there's a ray of light and hope here, it's that this is not the Cold War.